3.2 million acres of land, which as you know, is dominated by residential, commercial, and industrial development. Strong and steady enough to mold the earth with their labors, Native American beliefs believe that giant beavers fetch the mud with which the earth is built. When you think about it, it's not such an outlandish idea when I said as beavers and all their farms have lived on this continent for over a million years, long enough to modify the majority of watersheds in North America. In fact, I was told that we owe much of our tillable land to their efforts. If you dig down in any farmer's field, you're likely to come upon silt that long ago had accumulated in the stillness of an ancient beaver pond. In building their dams, beavers are the only species besides humans that create their own habitat who, who can affect change over large habitat by building structures. Native Americans relied heavily on beavers for food, medicine, tools, and clothing. That's an interesting quiver on the left there. Um, they were also bartered in exchange between different Native American groups before European traders arrived. They were taken year round as needed. Uh, the Indians used snares, spears, deadfalls, and clubs, by, and they also drained the ponds. In a culture where all animals were respected for both their practical and spiritual values, the beaver was honored, especially as a source of guidance on family matters. And you'll learn how familiar the beavers are as we go along. Uh, this Native American said the beaver provides everything perfectly well. It gives us kettles, hatchets, swords, knives, bread. In short, it provides everything. So uh, to the Native American culture, beaver is very important. And as you'll see later on, uh, important in other ways. Um, so here you see um, the spread of the beavers and you see the areas, the light colors where uh, not so many are held and uh, obviously none in Hawaii the Philippines. Um, so the beaver is native to Canada, as I said, and it did spread out throughout the U.S. Um, they have been introduced in many other countries um, and around the world. In fact, beavers are back in England after an absence of 400 years. I had a friend of mine from Scotland recently send me pictures of beaver knobs. He was out walking at lunchtime along the River Perth. He said, aren't these beaver knobs? And I went, they sure are. So you must get some, you must be getting some beavers there. So there were 60 to 100 million beaver in North America prior to the arrival of the Europeans. Today, there are only about six to 12 million, one sixth of the original population. Again, it's estimated that we have upwards of 10,000. But again, as you, as you know, if you've heard my wildlife talks, nature's random, animal species are random and it's hard to get an exact count. Um, and I want to go back to this. Hold on. Um, for two centuries after the first colonists arrived, beaver pelts were very much an important medium of exchange in North America, not only between the Native Americans and the new settlers, but also between the colonists and Europe. Uh, the commercial trade in fur bearers, and fur bearers are animals with fur, that's what they're called, especially beavers, did help drive the early economic and historic development of this country. Uh, the colonists would use the Native Americans to, uh, to get pelts for them and pay them a pittance. Um, but these pelts were in great demand in Europe where the fur was made into high quality felt then fashioned into hats. By the early 1800s, the beaver top hat was the fashion raised in England. And you can see some of the hats that were made out of them. The Queen's Buckingham Palace Guard still wears beaver hats as does uh, our Stetson the felt hats were made out of beaver fur. Uh, when the Hudson Bay Company monopolized the fur trade, and if you're historic uh, readers, you've probably heard of them, and they did use the Native Americans to trap the beaver, and they, they just give them very little, but there was a medium exchange that was created, that's on the bottom right. The name of that coin was a made, M-A-D-E, beaver. <laughs> Pretty clever name, huh? The worth of one uh, male beaver pelt harvested in the winter months uh, was one of these coins, a made beaver. In 1795, uh, you could buy, uh, one made beaver would buy you a sword blade, four made beavers could buy you a gallon of brandy, and six would buy you boots. So we see their priorities there. Uh, between 1652 and 1657, the Springfield fur trader named John Pynchon, which we know is a pretty well-known family in Connecticut's origins, 
sold 8,992 beaver pelts from the Connecticut River drainage. Pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, the demand for the fur overseas allowed the North American colonies to pay off large debts to England through their beaver trapping. And much of this country was uh, explored and mapped by trappers and voyagers who went west to unsettled ter territory in search of beaver pelts. And the settlers, when they went west for farming and other reasons, would use these, uh, these different um, maps that were made by these fur-bearing bear uh, hunters. By the mid-1800s, as you know, much of the east had been cleared of forests and thousands of acres of wetlands were drained for agriculture. And as the settlers could push westward, these land use practices continued. There was no laws regulating the harvest of beavers or any other species of wildlife for that matter. And so they were just hunted and killed uh, and pretty much beavers extirpated from New England uh, by the mid 1800s. Uh, they were no longer here in Connecticut nor the Northeastern United States. Uh, hold on a second. Some people are having a problem hearing me. Okay, I'm gonna move closer. Okay, so this uh, landowner, a Dutch landowner said, the beaver is the main reason for the initial settlement of the fine country by Europeans. The fur is made into the best hats that are worn throughout Europe. So the slaughter of beavers did transfigure North America's waterways. Um, in a healthy beaver rich creek or stream, dams slow water flows, capture sediment and counteract erosion. But after the beavers and their what I call dam speed bumps disappeared, streams eroded into their beds, cutting deep gullies in a process called incision. And these caused, this incision caused steep sided, straight jacketed streams, which lost the ability to spill over into the floodplains and recharge aquifers. Uh, I'm telling you all this because I want to tell you the value of a beaver. And, but going back to their fur, Beavers have up to 23,000 hairs per one third of a square foot. Imagine that. Some of the thickest fur in the animal world and they have the densest and warmest and the most waterproof of all. And listen to this. In fact, they, they have as many hairs in an area smaller than a dime than we have on our heads. I guess that doesn't apply to you guys who lost your hair, but no offense, it can help us. <laughs> But anyway, uh, this dense fur though with a thick undercoat and it's become prized again, it was uh, for so long and still. Trapping plus habitat loss uh, led to the diminishment of these populations. And by the 20th century, there were less than 100,000 in the US. Um, and I keep getting text. I don't, I don't know if you can't hear me, I don't understand because my volume's up and I can't really do anything about it. Uh, all right, sorry. Um, beavers are keystone species. And what this means is that they, as a keystone species, have a disproportionately large effect on their environment relative to the abundance. Their role is similar to the top block in an arch. If you pull that block out, the entire structure crumbles. Beavers play a critical role in the watersheds of North America by maintaining the structure of the surrounding ecological community. Uh, their presence in these watersheds affects not only the types and number of many terrestrial and aquatic plants and animal species, but it also main, maintains the health of the water system and the hydrology of watersheds. Uh, beavers are known as an ecosystem engineer, and that's an organism that again creates, changes, or destroys a habitat. There's perhaps no clearer example of a keystone engineer than the beaver. Uh, again, river ecosystems rely on the beaver to take down older dead trees. You might not have thought about that, but they take down the trees and that allows uh, healthier new trees to grow up in abundance. Uh, the dams divert water and rivers and create these wetlands that allow a variety of these plants to thrive. Um, the beaver's favorite trees to eat are aspens, birches, and will willows. And again, when they remove this overstory of kind of dead trees, uh, they do make way for the understory. And understory is that soft two to three foot high growth that you see in fields and stuff that eventually comes back into forests. So these are some of the, some of the species that benefit 
from beavers. I, I've taken all these pictures uh, when I've been out and about in the kayak. Uh, many trout and salmon populations rely on beaver dams to sort sediment and regulate water flow. And without beavers to build the dams, populations of these fish would decline rapidly. Fish are food for, as you know, for a lot of carnivores and omnivores. Uh, again, these wetlands uh, make it very rich for plants uh, and animals and all because of the beaver. Uh, this picture I call the angry beaver. I was on the Bantam River and I was paddling along. I came around the corner and I heard something hissing and here was this muddy beaver looking at me and hissing and I'm kind of like, oh, sorry, I didn't know I was in, I didn't know I was disturbing you. I think this beaver's had a fight before because if you look at his tail, there's like a little chunk out of it. Anyway, the beaver is a rodent like rats, mice, and squirrels. It's North America's largest rodent. Uh, the adult beaver can weigh uh, between 30 and 65 pounds, and they're typically 24 to 36 inches long, not including their tail, which adds another 12 to 18 inches, so pretty long. Uh, they're semi-aquatic rodents, and they live in around water, obviously, with a body uniquely suited to the environment it inhabits. Um, they, they're very awkward on land. Uh, they have powerful muscles and short legs. No, 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 no. no, that's okay. <laughs> Sebastian. <laughs> you. You silly. Hello. Oh, I know what kind of balls those are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> show off this ball. Yeah, very nice. That's I can big. hide it in my mouth. I'm so big. Sorry, everybody. I think we're having another conversation going on. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, Erica, I think you need to mute people. Uh, I'm going to stop until everybody's muted. All right, I don't know what to do. Um, all right. Um, okay, the heavy body, the, the beaver is very heavy body. They have powerful muscles and short legs, and they're very slow moving on land. Uh, but as again, they're very well adapted for water. Uh, they walk on all four legs on land, but if they're carrying mud or sticks, they may hold the materials in their front paws and walk upright. They can live 10 to 15 years in the wild. Again, you know, it's hard to tell on species, you know, because we're not tagging them or anything. We're just taking an average of observations of different marshes. Uh, there have been reports of them living up to 20 years in the wild. In captivity, one beaver lived to be 25 years old. Uh, so they're uniquely adaptable and distinctive among animals. Uh, their soft pelts can range in color from black to brown, which is what we see mostly around here, maybe with some red highlights. Uh, out west, they get reddish brown to blonde. It's kind of a sun thing. Uh, their dense underfur is overlain with long, shiny guard hairs. Uh, when a beaver dives, air bubbles are trapped beneath its underfur next to the beaver's skin, and this provides them insulation uh, for all different uh, temperatures of water, uh, and that allows it to survive in icy waters. They're, one of the toenails on each hind foot is split, and this helps them get, uh, get oil from near their rear of their body and to groom themselves and help waterproof that fur. Uh, their hind legs are webbed for swimming. And again, they have that flat, almost hairless tail that's 12 to 16 inches long. And they use it like a rudder to navigate, navigate their water environment and to balance upon as they stand on their hind legs gnawing on trees and various woody plants they harvest and use for food. And again, they're generally clumsy and unbalanced on land, but they're very graceful and elusive in water. Uh, and again, they use those web feet to propel them and the tail to steer. Uh, their hind and front feet could be, couldn't be any more different. The dexterous fronts are about the size of a deck of cards, but the hinds are nearly double that size, like flippers almost, uh, with wide webbing for flippered proportion. Uh, the large tail, hold on, sorry, is also used as a defensive mechanism and warning system. When a beaver's threatened, it will slap its tail on the surface of the water to warn off whomever they perceive as a threat, but also to warn their family members that there might be something around. Uh, and uh, oftentimes be bears, bobcats and otters will hang around the beaver lodges and try to get in there. But as you'll learn later, they pack them with mud and 
they're pretty impenetrable. Uh, they also have a very keen sense of smell that helps them find food sources, identify family members, and avoid predators. So here's, uh, here's some beaver um, tracks on the left. I don't smoke, but a friend of mine took this picture and it's the best picture I've had of tracks. So he, he put his Zippo light, lighter by him. Obviously all tracks are easy, easier to see in mud or snow. On the right is the beaver scat or their pelts, which you can see are quite full of uh, uh, woody stuff. They're omnivores. They do eat bark and, and plants and all kinds of stuff, which shows up in, in their scat. Uh, here's a beaver splash I got at sunset one night. Very hard to get because you don't know when they're going to do it. They don't really give you a good sign before they do it, but I was happy to get these shots anyway. And again, I had a really good one, but I, I thought it was on my PC and it's on my laptop, so sorry about that. Uh, here you can see a bobcat in the winter. Uh, this friend of mine wrote this book, The Camera Trapping Guide, and she's gotten many photos of predators trying to get into uh, to a beaver lodge, but again, the beavers pack it pretty tight, so it's pretty hard for the predators to get in there. Teeth are the business tool of the industrious beavers. Uh, I always thought their face was cartoonish. Uh, their signature top and bottom incisors file each other down into sharp chisel-like tools and make sharp work of many thick logs. Uh, they can be up to an inch long. They never stop growing. The orange color comes from iron in their diet which is, uh, keeps it uh, uh, giving them the most powerful and durable teeth in the an an sorry, animal kingdom. Uh, again, their teeth never stop growing, so they must constantly file them down by gnawing on trees and grinding their teeth together. I guess they wouldn't make very good bed mates, but they're up all night anyway, so they're not sleeping when we are. Uh, the, again, that orange enamel is filled with iron, uh, and it does wear a lot more slowly than the back of their teeth, which has dentin on it, like our teeth. Um, so that allows them to self sharpen as it chews through wood. Uh, again, besides humans, they're the only North American animal to fell large trees. The trees they cut down are, are on average from seven and a half inches to 53 and a half inches. Imagine that, all of those teeth. So it's a pretty remarkable animal. So here's a skull. Uh, the beaver skulls are massive when compared to those of other mammals of similar length. Uh, the skull and the mandible, as you see, are thick and heavy, providing a strong foundation for those large incisors. Uh, now, when you get a skull, you wouldn't have the, the orange colored uh, teeth. They would have faded, but, you know, this is just put in so you can see it. A less rugged skull would be unable to withstand the physical stress and strain of jaw muscle contractions or sufficient strength to cut hardwoods such as oak. Uh, here's some beaver gnaws. Uh, you can see them getting away. They gnaw trees in a circular pattern around the trunks. Stumps are pointed and scarred with broad tooth marks as you can see on the right. Uh, some marks might be higher up and that indicates that the work was probably done in winter when the beaver was standing on snow. And branches used to build lodges will often have the bark peeled off because they do consume the bark. Um, adult beavers cut, can cut over 200 trees per year, and they consume two to four pounds of wood per day. <laughs> Pretty amazing, huh? It takes them about 10 minutes to, to fell a three inch diameter tree, but they've been known to labor for hours over a record 60 inch circumference tree. Uh, oh wait, I think I have a beaver sound. Hold on, I forget. It doesn't show up, but uh, let me go back, hold on. All right, here's a beaver. Now listen, there's a bunch of different sounds. You'll hear it gnawing, you'll hear it making little noises. So I'm gonna play it for you. That's a tail splash. some beaver sounds you can hear. Uh, when I was at a beaver marsh uh, the other day, uh, we caught this beaver 
uh, and you can you can you'll be able to see it through the brush uh, in between where that log is kind of broken and the gnawing sound won't be as loud as what you heard because I was using my cell phone to record it but I'll show you anyway and you can watch the beaver gnaw. So there you have a little trace of uh, what a beaver looks like out in the wild. But of course, there's always branches and limbs and twigs in the way. So you do the best you can. And you don't want to really just get too close to disturb the animal. Uh, a beaver sensory orifices are uniquely adapted for its semi-aquatic existence. Some pretty remarkable things. One of the most fascinating beaver facts is that it can see underwater. They have three sets of eyelids. And like the eagle and other animals I've told you about, bobcats, they have that third eyelid is a transparent nicotating membrane uh, that enables them to close their eyes yet retain their vision while underwater. So pretty remarkable, like having some goggles. Uh, they have closing valves for their ears and their nose. And this I've not been able to see a picture of and can't understand, but they have fur lined lips that seal behind their teeth to prevent drowning during underwater stick grasp. So I can't quite imagine it, but it's true. Despite this, uh, even though they can see underwater, they have pretty poor eyesight, but they do have excellent hearing and a highly developed sense of smell. Um, so beaver swimming along. This is like kind of what you'll notice most of the time, their head above the water and their body extended behind them. Uh, these protections I just spoke about are built in because much of the work the beaver does requires they need to be able to remain underwater for several minutes at a time. They actually can stay underwater for 15 minutes. Uh, they don't breathe underwater. They have to hold their breath. Uh, and again, they can hold her for 15 minutes. That's pretty cool. Uh, and again, they do groom some oil from their tail area into their um, fur to keep it um, dry. Uh, this is a beaver going underwater, so you can just see the body there on the left as it goes under. Uh, here again, they'll swim around and, you know, keep an eye on you and go about their business. They generally come out, where they're called crispuscular. Uh, they come out about an hour before dusk, and they'll go in, or, or, you know, about an hour after dawn, but they do build their dams and cut their trees pretty much at night, so it's very hard to get a good photo. They're strictly vegetarian. And they're known to be choosy generalists when it comes to their diet. This means that they prefer certain types of plants above others, but they will sample and use a lot of other plant materials when and where they're available. Again, aspen, cottonwood, and willow trees are their preferred food. Uh, when, they, when they fell a tree, they'll often eat the bark off of it and use that. And they'll take, obviously, if it's a huge trunk, they're not going to move it. So they take the limbs off of it and use those for their lodges and dams but they will eat the bark for nutrient. Um, the inner bark of twigs, leaves, shoots, and roots they eat um, in the summer. They'll also eat non-woody herbaceous plants such as grasses, aquatic plants, and algae. They are omnivores, and though they are surrounded uh, by fish, and they even help coho salmon survive and thrive in their first year by providing still waters and pools to rest in, beaver do not eat fish. And for you book readers, unlike Mr. and Mrs. Beaver in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, I'm sure uh, in some other Disney movie where they have them eating fish, they do not eat fish. But then the one on the right, the otter says, good, then that's more for me. Again, I always like to combine history and literature. So if you like esoteric books, this book's pretty esoteric. Uh, in this book, Once They Are a Hats, Frances Backhouse writes about the relationship between beavers and water lilies. She visits a lake where beavers had long been absent, 
and were later reintroduced. And she notes the changes in the vegetation due to beaver activity. Water lilies being one of only many of the plant species impacted. So pretty interesting book, again, if you like esoteric things about animals. Uh, I was paddling along with my friend uh, on, uh, I think, maybe Winchester Lake, I'm not sure, in the fall. And I see this weird thing, and it looked kind of extraterrestrial to me. And I'm like, what the heck? So I, of course, didn't pick it up, but my friend came over and got it. And later on, a, a water biologist friend of mine told me that's a lily pad tuber root. And this spring, we've seen them all over the place, but they're brown now. They've turned colors. And uh, again, the in the fall, the beaver will even eat all the way down to the root of the lilies. And that's how some of these come up to the surface. Uh, Beaver lodge with saplings. Uh, beavers build up extra fat reserves for the winter, including on their tails, but they also store a winter food pile as well. Uh, this pile of branches and sticks is stacked near their lodge. You see the saplings shooting off into the water, so it can be accessed underwater when the pond is frozen over. Uh, it's a winter disaster for a beaver colony if the water level is too low and ice seals them into their large uh, lodge, they can starve. Uh, so they'll work busily in the fall trying to shore up their dams uh, to raise the water levels. And then again, these, uh, these uh, branches are accessible to them for food throughout the winter. So you can see this beaver carrying a stick. Um, here's some samples of beaver lodges here in Connecticut and in the Berkshires of Massachusetts that I've gotten when I've been out and about. Uh, different constructions, uh, different times of year. Um, the one you see over there, they'll create what's called a bank lodge first while they're going to build their uh, lodge out in the water so they have a safe place to be. Uh, the lodge consists of underwater tunnels that lead up into the lodge to an elevated nesting platform, and they line that with wood, chips, and other nesting material. And if you've ever seen a tree gnawed by a beaver, there's a lot of wood chips under it. Uh, they're very family-oriented animals, and they'll live in colonies from two to eight, and the eight would consist of their newborn kits and uh, their year-old to two-year-old offspring. They all share the lodge. Um, the lodge has a complex ar architecture, again, as I said, with many entrances and exits. Um, and uh, again, that food cast is available in the fall. They really start packing mud on the outside of the lodge to strengthen it and keep predators from coming in there. I call this like the double wide. <laughs> bank lodge. So uh, we've seen a couple of these before, like two separate uh, ones. It's hard to tell if, if one of the other lodges is the, the two-year-olds who branched out and decided not to leave the pond, but make their own lodge. I'm not sure. So uh, beavers create their own habit. You can see all the stuff on there. They'll even pick up garbage sometimes to pack it in for the winter. Up at the top, oftentimes you'll see the sticks kind of form like the top of a teepee and that has an air hole in it to give them air, but it's not, they'll line it with wood so that nothing can really easily get in. Um, again, the dens may be uh, dug in the banks uh, while their lodge is being built. Um, they're monogamous, monogamous and typically mate for life. Uh, they typically breed in the winter and give birth in the spring, so we're getting near the time uh, when they may be having their uh, kits. Uh, after reaching sexual maturity, the subadult beaver around two plus must leave and find a mate and set up a new colony, and oftentimes it's nearby. So, uh, so they can give birth now from any time in April till June, depending on whether and when they mated. Uh, again, here's an underneath uh, diagram of the lodges. Again, they're domed piles of sticks. Not usually that close to the dam, but they could be. Um, they rise up out of the water. And again, they have these different entrances and exits uh, from the lodge. So you see they can go under the ice there, grab the little shoots and branches that they've left there, and uh, they're able to eat. Here's another look of their nest in there. They also build channels, which I'll show you off the lodge, where they can go in the water. And as long as we're not in a drought, it'll have water and they can go gnaw a tree, bring it back uh, without having predators set upon them. Uh, baby beavers are called kits and they're born again, as I said, in the late spring. And they just are just over a pound and fully furred when they're born. 
Uh, a beaver can have up to nine kits. A lot of wild animals that might be uh, susceptible to prey will have more babies, like you know rabbits or stuff like that, mice, because then they'll have survival of the fittest and some of the, the breed or species will survive. Um, the newborns can walk and swim as soon as they're born, but I can guarantee you the mother keeps them herded in that, in that nest for a while so they get healthy and not uh, preyed upon. Uh, they do stay in the lodge as they grow, uh, so they're not ever out on their own. And again, until the beaver's two years old, they spend most of their time eating, growing, and learning and they'll help the parents repair the lodge and store food for the winter. Although they're generally sociable animals, uh, the exception to this is when they work. They pretty much work independently on a dam and cutting trees, and they'll tend to have little contact with each other while working. The bottom photo I was happy to get in Norfolk not long ago. Uh, I haven't ever been able to take a photo of beavers together. Again, I was shooting through branches, but I was happy to see them swimming side by side to get a photo. So uh, no way to tell what age or sex they are that way. Uh, these are the channels they'll create uh, along a river or in a pond and they'll slide down and they'll go up in there and they'll gnaw on trees either to eat or to bring some twigs back. Um, they establish their territories by creating scent mounds, which are pretty much a big blob of mud where they uh, mix their pungent uh, castoretum with muds and leaves. Uh, many biologists call these mud pies. Uh, they're marked with drops of castoretum and it's a musk that's so strong. Uh, uh, it can, uh, there are over 50 volatile substances in castoretum and every beaver has a unique odor signature, kind of like we have unique fingerprints. Uh, believe it or not, humans use castoretum in perfume, uh, but also to, leave, for also to leave memorable messages. I can't imagine, but they do use it for various perfume. Um, there could be 40 to 120 of these mounds within the home range of a beaver, which can be up to like two miles. Uh, and again, these channels are constructed to, to get them out of their lodge into the forest so they can harvest trees without uh, crossing land. So here you can see some of these channels filled with water and you can see some of those beaver nod sticks there. This one was not too far from a lodge. Um, uh, here's a beaver going in the water, a little out of focus, but just to show you, it, it's a big humped back. Uh, beavers construct dams again at night uh, across streams because the resulting ponds extend their access to trees, uh, either swallowed or approached by rising waters. Uh, all the dams are somewhat different. Uh, they could be constructed of mud and plant materials dredged and hauled from beneath the water surface. They can measure only a foot high or six feet high. Uh, more often dams are complex structures of cut branches and logs. You can see a mishmash filled and cemented with mud, decomposing debris, even rocks have been found uh, below the surface of the water. Uh, oftentimes they'll get, you can see on the top right, uh, particularly in the fall, they'll cut uh, pieces of limbs and set them vertical to try to help hold the dam. Uh, the largest dam was uh, 10 feet high and 2,970 feet in length. That was in the Grand Tetons. Uh, so that's on the left. Uh, in fact, until recent improvements in remote sensing, beaver dams are one of the few animal signs that were visible from space. Again, here you can see here's a dam, how they just kind of press everything there and pack it in with uh, mud. Some are little sticks, some are big sticks. Uh, they start a dam by carrying long lengths of wood like you see there to the site in their mouths. They'll secure one end of each of these in the stream bottom with the opposite end facing up into the current. Then more sticks and branches of smaller length are piled on. These are caught as you see by the longer lengths which create kind of a lattice, you know, a beaver lattice upon which mounds and mounds of mud and muck and other dredged items are placed and packed down by the force of the water and by the beavers themselves until a dam is nearly waterproof. Unlike in cartoons, beavers do not pack mud into dams in their lodges with their tails, but they do on occasion comically walk on their hind legs with an armload of muddy debris tucked underneath their chin. That's something I'd like to see, but I'd have to be out at nighttime to do that. I just threw this picture in. I was going to throw more recent in, but like I said, I realized that I had processed them on my laptop and not my PC, so I couldn't get them today. 
This is a local dam, beaver dam. As you see, it's had quite a lot of damage during the winter. So the beavers have to get busy and shore it up again because it's letting a lot of water through. But this was actually yesterday and after we had all those rains, you know, that probably didn't have enough uh, heavy uh, sticks in there to shore it up. Um, here's another dam in the area. As you can see, it's not very tall at all, but it is holding back water. Uh, the, it's more of a horizontal dam, uh, but you know, the beavers, it did hold through the winter and uh, has been very effective in keeping that wetland uh, important. Um, here's something that kayakers cause, uh, not a good thing. This is on the Bantam River. People keep paddling over this uh, to go to the other part of the river where I think there's other access points. Uh, then the four beavers, you know, in the fall, they're trying to get ready and stop up the dam they have to go back and keep repairing that. And I think they probably repair it every night and then it gets uh, moved every day. So if you're one of those paddlers, go off to the side, even though you get your foot muddy, then wear rubber boots and let the beavers, especially in the fall, keep their dams intact. Uh, here's night moves. A friend of mine got these uh, photos with a wildlife cam at night. So here they are working very busily on the dam. Pretty fascinating, I think. You see ones that 10 p.m., one's at 9 p.m., one's at 12, so they're working pretty much all night. Uh, uh, so you, you might have seen them out at dawn and dusk, but it is rare to see them gnawing trees or building dams because they do do that at night. Internally, the beavers are pretty much a metabolic miracle. No animal can digest fibrous cellulose and tough woody lignin so well. Uh, they have a knack for Coprophagy, I'm going to spell that for you, C-O-P-R-O-P-H-A-G-Y, and it's kind of gross, eating their poop to squeeze out a second round of nutrients. So this helps, but so does the fact that their intestine appro uh, approaches six times the length of their body. So a lot of space to digest in. Again, they eat around one to four and a half pounds per day as they need it but it takes 60 hours for the food to pass through their systems. Hey, that's longer than bacon to go through ours, isn't it? Uh, but when it does, like many species, this spreads nutrients and other matter that over time become rich matter for the ecosystems. A lot of people, some people ask me, what good are bears? I went, well, you know, bears eat a lot of berries, a lot of plants, a lot of other matter. And when they poop, you know, that spreads it all over the place. So all of that contributes to the ecosystem. This is a downed tree that I took a photo of and you can see the teeth marks on there. They've been gnawing away at the bark, you know, getting nutrients. Uh, and uh, they'll use the branches of these trees, but obviously they're not gonna move this whole big tree. Um, but you, if you see a partially gnawed standing tree in beaver territory, it often will have an hourglass type shape because of the way they gnaw. Uh, again, uh, they're probably trees even larger than 60 inches in diameter that they've gnawed, you know, but they might be unseen uh, that have been felled. A friend of mine's son next to a pretty big tree had beaver knot. He never got it all off of there. So again, they do spend their whole lives cutting down trees, building lodges and dams along streams. Again, these streams help make wetlands. Uh, uh, and again, many animals uh, do depend on these wetlands, so. Can, can resist that cartoon. <laughs> so one interesting fact about beavers, they're not truly lumberjacks. They can't control the way the tree falls and on occasion it falls on them. Uh, so um, I, I've never witnessed it, don't want to, but uh, it could happen. Uh, busy as a beaver and eager beaver, cliches that are built on wood solid truth uh, they've been recognized as hard workers for several centuries, but it was only until the 20th century that the phrases busy as a beaver and e eager beaver became popular. It finds its origins around the 40s and peaks around the mid 50s. It's possible that this idiom became popular because of the loose rhyme between eager and beaver. You know, people like to rhyme stuff. Uh, some sources also speculate it may be related also to the idiom busy as a beaver which refers to someone who is very industrious. Um, most sources state that it was during World War II and the US Armed Forces that the term became uh, more popular, referring to a soldier who was excited to impress his superiors by performing duties that others would not like to do. I guess that's uh, 
cleaning the latrines and uh, peeling potatoes. I don't know. Uh, the expression like brown noser can have either a positive or a negative connotation. Sometimes people use it to show how hardworking and energetic a person is. Other times people use it sarcastically to show that that person's working a little too hard. Um, so here's some more. There's a more beaver noise, just uh, slipped in there. Um, so if you're out and about, there's three species that can look alike and often are mistaken for a beaver. Uh, many a kayaker, fisher person, or nature enthusiast has at one time or another mistaken these three species for each other. And because Connecticut's home to all these, I thought I'd give you a few things to help you differentiate. Obviously, if they're all sitting side by side, clearly the beaver would be much bulkier and much larger, but uh, most of the time we don't see them side by side. And even these uh, images don't give you the, the size uh, depth, but it shows you the profile in the water. So we got the muskrat at the top, which I meant to mention that the beaver does oftentimes in the winter allow muskrat to come into their uh, lodge and stay with them. They're not, they're very gregarious towards them. Um, all of these are semi-aquatic animals. Uh, the muskrat is the smallest of this aquatic trio. Uh, it's, immediate, it's also a rodent. It can range from 16 to 28 inches and add another seven to 11 inches for their tails. Uh, but they only weigh between one and a half to four pounds. So very small in relation to a beaver that can be up to over 60. Uh, so again, uh, we don't have the comparison side by side, but trust me, muskrats are very smaller than the beaver or otter. Uh, they can though look beaver-like out of water. They have it, they'll sit in a much a similar way, uh, all balled up and fuzzy. Uh, but the main difference you can say between the two is the tail. Muskrats have a long skinny tail Sometimes when they're swimming, that tail kind of is curved behind them, or sometimes it sticks straight up out of the water, kind of like a chipmunk running across the road, kind of like an antenna. Beavers look for that wide, flat tail. Now, I can tell you, I've been very close to beavers swimming by, and the tail is just below the surface of the water. So unless you're above the beaver, uh, it's hard to see the tail, but you see this profile is like the big ears sticking up, the eyes, the nose all above the water with all that beautiful fur behind it. So um, river otters, again, are much more slender. They're 21 to 32 inches long with 20 more inches for a, a, a thin tail. They only weigh up to 30 pounds. So again, uh, they're much smaller than uh, the beaver. Uh, they are carnivores, unlike the muskrat and the beaver. They're also members of the weasel family and their favorite food or guess what? Fish. But they'll also eat amphibians, turtles, and crayfish just depending on what's available. But the main difference is really fun to see the otters swim. Uh, you just oftentimes will only see their head and neck, sometimes a little bit of the body. They have more of a curved form in the water, not as flat, and their tail will ride just below the surface. But when they pick up speed, and beavers can swim about five miles an hour, but otters can swim up to 10, they'll start picking up speed and they do what's called porpoising. So they almost look like a porpoise going through the water. Uh, they also dive a lot more frequently than the muskrat and the beaver. Uh, and they'll be in groups of more than one more often. Uh, they, especially in rivers and lakes. Uh, so otters are fun to watch. They slide down the banks. Uh, they're, they're really fun to see. Uh, here's some, here's their sitting profile. Now, not to scale, obviously, but uh, you know, the beavers like can be twice the size of the otter, but not as long. And the muskrat, they both, you see, sit similarly when they're on the side of the, the water. But I actually love otters and I've really only, I've only ever seen, let's see, five in person river otters. I've seen two sea otters and I saw a Eurasian otter when I was hiking on the Isle of Mull in Scotland. So that was quite a treat. Uh, here again, the profile of the beaver, uh, pretty big uh, and the tail just below the water. Uh, there you can see that fur. So we have to talk whenever we talk about beaver and states like Connecticut, we have to talk about beaver human conflicts. Uh, some of the conflicts are flooding, tree cutting, damage to man-made structures, impacts on other natural resources, water to quality, and public health issues. 
Um, while the beavers are valued as a keystone species and they do enhance and create wetland uh, wildlife habitat, uh, their activities often cause conflict with humans. Uh, the majority of these are the flooding of roads, the killing of trees. Uh, the, the trees can be killed by felling or girdling, which is like down below, or by the flooding of their root systems for long periods of time. Uh, heron rookeries depend upon beaver marshes, but the problem is the trees that they often nest in, over time, those roots are going to rot and those trees will fall. But if they don't fall before a beaver leaves, if, if a beaver leaves the pond where the rookeries are, the herons will eventually leave. Anyway, uh, one of the most common complaints uh, in Connecticut of beavers uh, is the plugging of culverts. They can cause property flooding and, as you see above, road uh, damage. Um, it can be costly and frustrating for landowners and others who are, use the areas. Uh, many of these problems are caused by the direct results of human encroachment on beaver habitat. I always encourage people uh, to get involved. Uh, if you don't want to be on your conservation commission, which is usually appointed, or on your inland wetlands, which is, is elected, uh, keep an eye out for development, you know, and make sure that, you know, your precious um, wetlands are not being encroached upon in, in a wrong way. Uh, municipal land use planners and inland wetlands commissions should also be aware, aware of beaver activity along wetlands and water courses. Uh, there can be standard setbacks uh, from wetlands that may need to be increased uh, based on site specific characteristics. Uh, so some of the things that people have tried, a man in Massachusetts uh, created what's called a beaver deceiver. Uh, so they'll uh, put these up on culverts you know, to try to keep the beavers from blocking the culverts up. It has moderate success. Um, many other lands are, are negatively impacted. Uh, our agricultural land can be uh, flooded. Uh, so what happens is that basically it's left up to the landowner what they want to do to solve the beaver problem. Uh, trapping, uh, there is a Connecticut beaver trapping season from January 1st to March 31st and December 1st to December 31st. Uh, when a beaver is trapped, they must be properly tagged before they're sold, exchanged, given away, or even disposed of. Um, it is illegal um, to trap and move beavers now. Uh, the DEP does not do it if there's a problem beaver. Uh, it will be removed um, by uh, what we call narcons, they're nuisance control officers, uh, if the landowner, if that's what they want. Uh, if not, uh, if there, there's a lot of communities that are built along ponds, you know, like some of those condo communities and stuff, uh, you can put a fencing around trees so they can't get at them, but you can't use chicken wire, you have to use a little stronger uh, metal uh, there. So. Um, Again, it's left up to the landowner to deal with the situation as they want. But again, even for a landowner, uh, they have to get uh, a Narcon uh, nuisance control officer to remove the, uh, to trap the beaver. So here's some interesting facts. Uh, again, I've told you they're the only animal to, not North American animal, but I think, I think elephants do kind of move stuff, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, humans and beavers fell large trees. Uh, again, their goo is a uh, castoretum. Uh, interesting fact, their sex is determined by expressing the anal sacs for odor. I didn't make this up. Females smells like cheese and males motor oil, but that's the only way you can sex them. So uh, uh, beavers are back in England and the UK after 400 years. And no, castoretum is not made into castor oil, that awful stuff we had to take as kids. But as I said, again, it is used in some perfumes, which is hard to imagine, but musk is used in perfumes. So I'm eager to answer any questions. Um, I'm going to come back to the screen and uh, get rid of this. It'll take me a second. Uh, okay, and it asked me to save. Sorry, it shouldn't have asked me to save, but it did, so... Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Now we'll see if there's any questions and then you can also unmute everybody. Uh, and, uh, 
Okay, so if somebody wants to know where, where they are in Connecticut, um, they're pretty much all over. Uh, I mean, I know of many uh, beaver marshes that you can drive along just going on most of our country roads. I was up on a road and just over the line in Massachusetts and I went by three beaver marshes. So anytime you see like a bunch of, uh, a lot of times you see that awful mm -hmm. Phragmites, Phragmites, that golden uh, what, invasive. Uh, you'll see, uh, be but what I would do is look for the beaver lodge as you pass any kind of water beside the road that's marshy, just look in there and you'll probably see a beaver lodge. And uh, if it's, you know, land that's not private, you can just put your little chairs out and sit around dusk and, and watch the beavers swim. So uh, I'm not sure, but I'm sure up where y'all are, there's a lot of uh, beaver marshes as well. Anybody else have a question? Hi, Charlotte. Good to see you guys. Uh, anybody else have a question? Oh, I meant to come back. Where am I? Sorry. Uh, there we are. This talk is really, really interesting. The photographs have been fabulous. Oh, thanks. Good to see you, too. <laughs> I think I've used one of your books I got for uh, when you gave me so generously those books. There's a couple of them on nature that I've, I've used for some, sure. of, my, some sure. of my research. So thank you. Great. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, hope to see it. Oh, are there a lot fewer in the southern parts? Of, no, I think they're pretty much spread all over. Uh, Fairfield has a healthy population of uh, of beavers as well. They're down on the shoreline. As far as I can tell, they're pretty much all over the state. Sometimes, you know, uh, the, some of the more, well, actually a lot of the ponds uh, my friend and I go on are not that remote. I mean, they're remote. They're not like big lakes in the city, but they're not, they're easily accessible. They're part of a state park or something. So, um, you know, you can, you can find them pretty much around. They're kind of fun. And like I said, if you see I know a couple of beaver lodges in my area that are kind of near the road and uh, you know there's you can just sit right there if you don't mind the bugs <laughs> but they don't they don't come out till like it'll be like after six you know what I mean and you just have to be patient and then you'll see them start swimming around they usually send one scout out first to kind of see what's out and about and uh, then they'll start swimming around so they are pretty much everywhere um the uh, offspring do stay close to home uh, for almost two years. Uh, the parents will let them swim off a little around the lodge, but not too far because, uh, you know, they're, they're small and they're still susceptible to prey species. And, you know, bobcats swim, not that they would necessarily take a beaver in water because that would probably be a tough fight. In fact, I meant to tell you, if you're near a beaver marsh or somewhere where you know there are beaver, I wouldn't let my dog in that water because beavers, you know, with those teeth could do kind of a damage. So, so. I, think, I think more often than not, beavers are much better for our ecosystems. But again, you know, living in a state like Connecticut, as much as beautiful uh, open areas that we have, my town is 65% state forest or reservoir, there's still a lot of uh, Roads that fragment habitat, you know, a lot of animals get hit, even if they get hit on the road. So, um, but we should cherish that we have to. Um, I, I'm not sure, Jenny, but I think someone, Joseph Adgley, do you want to ask a question? Yes, yes, I do. I'd like to. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was very interesting and, um, I live on a, um, a, uh, close to a lake and I'm on the backflow of the lake. So I, um, there's beaver activity going on here. Um, I've lived here for a while and right now it's, it's pretty active. I've seen them swimming out in the, out in the lake and I have damage to some of the trees that are like off my backyard. So what I am always worried about is that if one of these uh, young trees can crash over and land on top of my garage, which would cause damage, uh, it hasn't happened yet, but they've stripped a lot of um, trees 
uh, in my backyard, and I'm always uh, worried that um, the water level uh, on the side in the back where I live is going to be raised up uh, because of the um, lodge. There's a beaver lodge that I could see out there, and it just seems to be growing uh, larger and larger um, through the years. But anyway, what I want to ask uh, is that um, I, there's something that, um, that was put in uh, on my yard um, years back, something called the beaver uh, baffle. Are you familiar with that? Well, it's, kind of, it's another type of receiver, yeah. Um, but they don't always work that well. Uh, but Joe, if I were you, I would, you can put some kind of metal wire. I know it doesn't look great, but I guess you could paint it around those trees that are susceptible, you know, so they can't chew on it. Um, then the, the beaver lodges do grow bigger, but they don't make the water bigger. It's the beaver dams that make the water uh, raise up. So, um, uh, yeah, so if you really have trouble, you know, you would have to contact the DEP and discuss with them, uh, you know, what, what options you have, what suggestions they might have over what I've told you. Uh, they might have, you know, sometimes depending on how the water is flowing near you, there might be another contraption that's a solution, uh, you know, maybe not. So it just depends on uh, your tolerance for it. And, uh, you know, what, you know, if you, like I said, if you don't want the beavers anymore, then they trap them and they're killed. So, um, you know, uh, you could uh, contact the DEP and they could probably give you some more suggestions of how to coexist with them. Um, so not a great answer, but it's the only answer unless I, unless you had a big, uh, unless you had a big wood fence, you know, but like, that's not cheap either. And they might chew that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I think there's one question about, um, if there are any in New York. Oh yeah. There's, there's beavers everywhere. I mean, you know, except for, like I said, in parts of the in parts of the really arid Southwest, you know, where there's not good habitat, not a lot of trees. I mean, they're not going to cut down cacti, you know, that's not going to make much of a lodge, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you go over to Millerton and right across, you know, the border from Connecticut, there's tons of beaver marshes over there. They're really all over the place. You know, what I noticed is that people aren't, they don't observe things as well as they think they do. Like I used to challenge my friends, like when you go home from work, you know, like see, uh, see whatever, you know, 10 things you never saw before. And, and they'd be amazed at, you know, what's always there and they never see. So uh, truly, you know, I just love to, I just get in, now of course I'm a Texan, but I love to get in my car and I just drive all over the place. My brother thinks I'm either going to get eaten by a bear. Or I'm going to just disappear on some road like the twilight zone. But, you know, like you guys, you know, living up there in Falls Village, there's all of these like back roads. I mean, you can just take a little drive and I can guarantee you in like five miles, you're going to run across a beaver marsh. Uh, same in New York state. I mean, New York state, I, I have a joke now since COVID uh, and this is not an aspersion on New Yorkers, but along our river here in the West branch of the Farmington, like more cars are from New York than like Connecticut. I'm like, don't they have any fishing streams in New York? You know, not, not that I mind, but what I'm saying that is because you do have a lot of water and a lot of marshes and, you know, that part of New York is uh, north of, uh, you know, north of the city, you know, go up into Dutchess County and on up into, I'm not sure what County Miller, those towns are in there. You know, they are just replete with nature like we are here as well. Uh, and you usually don't have to go too far off the road to find it. You know, can, you can get like Google maps are pretty good. My friend Susan is a geocacher and those t tend to have the best maps. You know what I mean? You're like, put those maps on, she can get us out of uh, the labyrinth, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, but anyway, you can look at those uh, topographical maps, you know, and you can see all the little streams and stuff and just, you know, follow one of those. And most streams go to a beaver marsh or, you know, a beaver pond or, and there's a lot of big, you know, medium sized lakes that actually have beaver lodges on them as well. So let's see, somebody's got to, let's see, drag a piece of lumber in here. You know, the beavers, Amy, uh, the beavers, like when they kick out the sub-adults, the two years old, they have, to, they have to find a new place. 
So they generally will go down or up the stream from their, you know, their mother home and start up. And sometimes it'll be the tiniest little stream, but once they get that dam going, you know, it's going to back up stuff and create a little habitat. Sometimes they don't get very big, you know, but they get big enough for the beavers to uh, exist and for other wildlife. Um, if you see a beaver lodge, um, there are, you know, there are a lot of abandoned beaver lodges. Generally, the wood on them will be like your deck when the, you know, when the woods turn totally gray like mine, you know, when you don't treat it or anything. Uh, like Susan and I have seen a bunch of lodges uh, this year already, and they've got brand new, fresh, you know, light tan, you know, like if you strip the bark off of a fresh uh, tree, they have new logs, on, you know, new limbs on them. So they continually add to them. Uh, also, what we've seen some dams that have leaves on the, on the twigs and on the branches because, you know, they, they don't eat the leaves, they just throw them on the dam. So that's also evidence that the beavers survived the winter and they're out and about and shoring up their dams. Um, what kind of leaves they would don't? So, okay, so um, whoever asked about driving around, seeing a lodge and no activity, again, the activity is really very close to dark. You know, they're not out much during the day. I'm not saying ever, you know, because, you know, one juvenile may say, I'm going to show you, I'm going to go out and about. But generally speaking, they only come out about an hour before dusk. Uh, and then they're out all night long. And then they come uh, back. Now, if you have a boat and are able to go next to a beaver lodge and just sit quietly, oftentimes you can hear those little noises they make. It's pretty cool. Uh, so, uh, but again, you have to be out kind of late to see them or very early. You know, early in the morning is good too. So um, they're pretty cool to see though. Uh, well, thank you. I, I like I like to talk to all the folks in uh, Falls Village and well, I have thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for this. About. this I'll being send you a list. Talk. I got more things I talk about and uh, happy to see all of you. And hopefully everybody's got to poke their shots in the arm and be healthy. And we'll all be back to live one of these days, uh, live talks. So uh, that, that would be great. Look forward to it. All right. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. And I'm sure we'll see you in the future. I'm going to end this meeting now. All right. See you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.